So um, to all the people in this call right now, so first of all, hello. Um, yeah, my name is Christo Petkov, as I have been introduced. Um, I am from the, uh, I am a PhD student from the University of Strathclyde, which is in the UK. And I am a part of the Department of Computer and Information Sciences there. So today we'll be talking about a topic which actually has a very wide range. Yeah, uh, it's actually causal structure learning. And in particular, I have been focusing um, in the last couple of months on developing a model based on Wasserstein generative adversarial networks, which could perform causal structure learning. So that is known as DAGWGAN. That is the official name of the model. And um, yeah, in this presentation, hopefully you would learn what causal inference is. Um, I would also provide you with a brief introduction and overview of the project, potential applications of causal structure learning and of the model, uh, technical model details, some results in evaluation and potential future work, which could be done to improve this model. All right, so first of all, what is causal inference? So causal inference aims to discover the underlying causal structure within data. So people might be like, um, yeah, okay, so that's basically discovering patterns within the data. And that could very well be the case, but in some cases it isn't. And the reason for that is because there are, um, differences between discovering statistical patterns in data, which are used in order to find dependencies within the data, and the underlying causal structure, which is actually the underlying cause for these dependencies. So for example, you may have a statistical pattern saying that column B causes column C, but the reality is that the causal structure suggests that even though there is a dependency between B and C, so C is dependent on B, actually the causal structure is, for example, A, which causes B, which causes C, which means that the dependency found using statistical patterns is actually a part of a transitive causal relationship, which is undetectable based on uh, statistical patterns. So that is the entire reason why we believe that causal inference and causal structure learning is important. And we also consider it one of the next steps for data association, not only within a data set, but also between different data sets, which basically means that you could have um, a, a hypothetical example where you use tabular data and also some images or videos or audios or something else. And you may actually be able to um, find causal relationships between all of these different pieces of uh, data sets or different pieces of data. So yeah, that's causal inference for you in a nutshell. Okay, so brief introduction time. Now, what you see over here, these two lines, is my attempt of saying what my model does in two lines of words. All right, so it basically takes the probability distribution of rows of input data plus the underlying causal structure of the same input data in order to create realistic and explainable synthetic data samples. Now, what does this even mean? Yeah, well, it means that the, caus the causality aspect of the model actually offers a unique property. It is not only used to objectively evaluate the data. Uh, there is a metric here, which I'll mention further down in the presentation called the structure Hamming distance. We will come back to that. Um, but the causality aspect also provides insight as to why the generated data is generated the way it is. So it basically offers a layer of explainability of the underlying convoluted model. So rather than just 
creating synthetic data samples based on probability distributions, which are usually just some numbers um, in a vector or array. Uh, you can use those, but also learn the causal structure of the input data and then put it in the synthetic data sample. So the synthetic data samples are actually going to have similar causal structure to the input data, which allows us to explain why that generated data is uh, generated the way it is. So that's, um, that's the layer of explainability we have added. Okay, now applications. Yeah, this is a very um, huge rabbit hole because the answer is absolutely anywhere. This causal learning um, framework along with pretty much any other framework could be used potentially anywhere in industry or in academia. And the reason for that is because it could potentially be used in any scientific area as long as there is data. So as long as you have data, you can pretty much extract causal information from it or, or learn it. So that's why I actually had to um, research where it is usually used. And I did that by typing causal inference in Google Scholar. Yeah. Um, and based on that, I found out that usually the areas are psychology, social studies, finance, and shockingly, healthcare. Healthcare is a big thing. Uh, because healthcare actually, yeah, if you don't get the causal structure correctly, yeah, people might suffer as a result, uh, or your model isn't going to get anywhere at all. Um, but yeah, also all of these are pretty much used for research purposes. And uh, as far as I'm aware, there have been several models uh, tried to be developed and put into industry, but um, they all have limited success. All right, and now this is the theoretical reasoning behind my model. So initially, I wanted to create a long lasting relationship between deep learning and causal structure learning. And I wanted to facilitate that relationship via WGAN and directed acyclic graphs. So the idea behind my research was to investigate whether the Wasserstein generative adversarial neural network could actually be used in the context of causal structure learning strictly from tabular data. And also, I, I would like to um, test a hypothesis that the involvement of the Wasserstein metric, also known as earth mover distance, could actually improve causal structure learning by generating more realistic synthetic data samples. Now, if you are well acquainted with WGAN, you know that WGAN is used to generate more realistic synthetic data samples already, but by default, it is not associated with causal structure learning at all. And if you are familiar with causal structure learning, you know that most deep learning approaches ever since um, 2018 actually use something known as continuous optimization. So by that, we basically mean a score-based function with an acyclistic constraint. Also, pretty much in all studies uh, for causal structure learning, the causal structure is re represented as a directed acyclic graph. All right, so with that being said, now it's time to get to the interesting part, and that is how do we actually use WGAN in the context of causal structure learning? Now, there are, I assume there are many ways of doing that, but this is just one approach, the approach I took. So what I did is I developed a model which combines an autoencoder and a WGAN architecture together with an acyclistic constraint. The model also utilizes an adjacency matrix, not only to represent a directed acyclic graph, but also to learn and visualize the outcome, which is also supposed to be a DAG. 
The key aspect here which makes this possible is that the adjacency matrix is explicitly learnable by the model together with other parameters. Basically, what I mean here is that we can kind of treat this adjacency matrix as a hyperparameter, which is set by default to something, and then over time it actually changes uh, based on the evolving uh, weights and biases of the model. Right, so this is the model architecture. Um, I would like to say that I apologize for this image because um, in all honesty, I probably could have done a better uh, job with it, but for the purpose of uh, this, um, for explaining the model architecture, I believe that simplicity serves me well. That's why, um, yeah, that's why it's the way it is. So we have input data X, which is put through an encoder, a latent variable Z is produced, and then that's fed into a decoder, and then we have reconstructed data X hat. The original input data along with X hat is, um, is inputted into a discriminator, and then more realistic data samples are produced with causal structure learned. That's basically the idea. Uh, so this model architecture actually results in the generation of less noisy and more realistic output while being easier to train. And this model architecture proves the hypothesis which I had earlier, which is, um, uh, which is this one, whether the involvement of the Wasserstein metric could improve causal structure. It turns out it actually does because um, this model architecture actually leads to an increase in quality of the synthesized data, which actually leads to an improvement in structured learning. Okay, now here we get into more details about um, all of the structures being used. So the first one is the autoencoder structure architecture. So by autoencoder, I just mean this bit in the model architecture. So basically the idea is that it is used to generate new data samples, but it also does not support causal structure learning by default. So how can that be incorporated? That is the big question. So it is incorporated by using an adjacency matrix, which is included as a learnable parameter in the encoder. We've already mentioned that, but we also use identity functions both in the encoder and the decoder. So basically what the encoder does is based on topological uh, sorting of the adjacency matrix A, the identity function actually produces a strictly upper triangular version of the adjacency matrix and then the decoder actually solves uh, or rather performs a triangular solve onto the output of the encoder. And basically that's how causal structure learning is actually done within this project, within this model. And the loss function is a reconstruction loss plus a regularizer. The, leg, the regularizer is used to avoid overfitting the reason I have put these like that is because both of these um, formulas can be different things at different times. For example, the reconstruction loss could be a mean squared error. It could also be a mean absolute error. It could also be negative log likelihood, which is the one I am using. And for the regularizer, it could be a KOD, KO diversions. It could be um, MMD. Um, maximum mean discrepancy, it could be uh, JSD, the Jensen-Shannon diversions, it could pretty much be a lot of stuff. In my case, it's a KOD. Okay, and then we have the WGAN architecture. So WGAN consists of two networks. One of them is a generator, one of them is a discriminator, and both of them either compete against each other or help each other to produce more realistic data samples. 
depending on your perspective, you can choose either the competition or the helping. It pretty much is the same thing. Um, so in this model, the generator is actually the decoder from the autoencoder framework. So if we go back over here, basically, this is the autoencoder framework. And this is actually the WGAN. So the decoder here is actually the generator, which competes with the discriminator. All right. And the discriminator actually supports gradient penalty. This is to prevent overfitting as well. And it is based on PAC GAN. And the entire reason for that is in order to handle mode collapse, which occurs only in discrete data where for example, when you have a lot of categories and one category um, isn't present enough times uh, or is present in a very small volume, then, for example, mod collapse is basically going to disregard that category at, um, altogether and then you would overfit. That's what mod collapse is, and I'm trying to handle it using the PAC GAN framework. Okay, loss function actually two. So we have the loss function for the discriminator, which is basically taking the generated data, the input data, and gradient penalty. And we have the loss function of the generator, which takes only the generated data. That is how these two loss functions are updated. And that's how these two networks are updated. Next, we have the acyclistic constraint. This is very important as without it, there will be no DAG at the end. There will be no directed acyclic graph. There will be a DG, which is known as a day is, which is known as a directed graph, which means it will probably contain cycles. All right. So yeah, we use an a uh, we use an acyclistic constraint to ensure that the resulting uh, that the output is actually a DAG. In the model, we use an acyclistic constraint from um, U et al. created in 2019. Uh, this is the same acyclistic constraint which they use in their famous model called the DAG GNN, where I is the identity matrix. By identity matrix, we basically just mean the values of A, pretty much. Alpha is a learnable hyperparameter. It could be um, anything. It's tweakable. As long as it's greater than zero, you should be fine. And A, circle A, is the Hadamard product of matrices. Hadamard product is just a fancy word of saying multiplication or product. Now here, with a lot of mental leaps and abuse of mathematical notations, you could, for example, rewrite this bit as A squared. Uh, but know that if you do that, you need to explain that A is actually a matrix and not a number. Yeah, so that's why we use this notation instead. All right, now after all of that has been said and done, now we finally get to the training. So training combines absolutely all, all of the losses you have heard so far and the explicit constraint. So we're trying to minimize the following loss function, which basically means that we have three of them. Actually, we have a loss function for the discriminator, for the generator, for the autoencoder, and we include an acyclistic constraint. And yeah, that is basically the final loss function. That final loss function is applied within something called an augmented Lagrangian. So this entire thing is equal to this. So this F, which could technically be anything, but in this case, it's this. Yeah. And here we have some new players. We have Lambda and we have C. Now, the reason why we use the augmented Lagrangian is because of the continuous optimization um, approach that we take in order to perform causal structure learning. So usually, Causal structure learning is very difficult because the DAG space is proven to be NP-hard, non-polynomial. So basically, that's um, the reason why 
the combinatorial approach will actually take forever. So what we are trying to do is we, uh, we are trying to use the augmented Lagrangian in order to divide the um, causal structure learning into sub problems. And these sub problems are controlled using the Lambda and the C. So Lambda and C are updated every time we loop. So we loop, first we loop K times. You need to make sure that you have enough K to loop. Uh, in my case, I've set that to 100, even though it never actually gets close to that. The highest I've ever gotten is 22, uh, but I prefer to have more than have less. Okay, so what we're trying to do is given lambda and C, we are trying to minimize this loss function in order to obtain uh, A and theta. Theta are the parameters of learning and um, a is basically the result, the resulting uh, adjacency matrix, which represents a DAG. So we increase C based on the value produced from the asclistic constraint. That value needs to be greater than a certain threshold. That threshold in my, um, in my model is actually a very small number. It is uh, a zero followed by eight other zeros and then followed by a one basically so it's something like 10 to the uh to one multiplied by 10 to the power of minus eight as far as i remember i think that's what i've said it to be so as long as the number is above that threshold then we basically update lambda and based on the updated lambda and the updated c this equation changes and that's how we perform um causal structure learning all right, results and evaluation. So for evaluation, we finally came back to the structural Hamming distance. This is the only metric I've used because I found it sufficient. Structural Hamming distance actually requires the ground truth graph and a learned graph. And it basically calculates the distance between the two. And the distance comes in the form of missing extra or reversed edges in the learned graph. So basically what happens is that the ground truth and the learned graph are compared and the structure Hamming distance actually tells us how many missing extra or reversed edges there are in the learned graph. For example, a complete copy of the ground truth would have structure Hamming distance of zero. So that's how you know you've created a complete uh, copy. You've learned a complete copy of the ground truth but for example, you could have learned that complete copy, but with one extra edge, for example, that is going to equal structure Hamming distance of one. So basically the higher the structure Hamming distance, the worse the results and vice versa. The lower the structure Hamming distance, the better the result. And now for some results, actually, so these result, uh, results are available within the paper. So I won't go over them here. This is just a gross over, um, yeah, oversimplification of all of them. But DAG WGAN has been compared against three other state-of-the-art models. We have DAGNO TIERS, DAGNO CURL, and DAG GNN. DAG WGAN completely outperforms DAGNO TIERS and DAGNO CURL in every single experiment and that GNN is competitive, however, is worse through the majority of the experiments. And by the majority, I mean that in all of the experiments that have been conducted, that GNN has produced better results only twice. Yeah, and all of the experiments and all the numbers are available in the paper. All right, so I said I wasn't gonna show any results. So what is this? Um, first of all, I would like to apologize for the grainy image and the quality, uh, but basically this is how um, the visualized output looks like. This is a complete copy of the ground truth for a synthetic data set. Couple of key things to note here, uh, other than the, the, the awful quality of the image. Um, the first thing is that there are no cycles in this graph. 
The second thing is that each node actually has a label. The third thing is that we handle transitive causal relationships. An example of that would be this one, for example, where one causes five and five causes two, therefore one causes two. And also, last but not least, is the thickness of the lines. Thickness of the lines actually indicates the strength of the causal relationship. So the thicker the line, basically that means that there is a concrete causal relationship and the less thick the line is, that means it's more abstract-like, but it exists nonetheless. All right. So here the quality of the image is a little bit better. And also, this is actually a real data set where we have a lot of X's and one Y. So we have a lot of X's, which are actually EEG scans. So this is a healthcare or medical data set where each X is an EEG, which actually um, is used in order to test for seizures. And Y is basically the, um, is the output which comes in the form of categories where you estimate what is the chance that you would have um, a seizure based on the tests conducted. So you would notice that not all axes actually point to the Y. And the reason for that is because of the fact that not all tests actually can be linked to you as a person having seizures. So basically what happens is that Y usually contains a probability of zero, but I actually removed it. I removed the probability of you as a patient having a seizure to be zero. I remove that and what happened is that following the causal relationships and actually following logic, the model managed to figure out that it is possible for you not to actually have a seizure. That's why, for example, X1 causes X9. That's why there is a sink here as well, which means that a lot of things actually point to pretty much nothing. They just end. And the hypothesis here is that based on trying enough tests which are all negative um you're not actually going to have a seizure and the model managed to figure that on its own okay future work evaluation that's very important the model has already been evaluated but as we continue to um stack up func functionality over time we would need to have evaluation all over again so that's why this is still there we need to have an objective evaluation using the structure hemming distance and potentially other met uh, metrics as well we also need to have an evaluation from people who are actually going to potentially be using the model we would also like to potentially use different types of data. As we mentioned in the beginning, this model only works with tabular data, but could potentially be used with um, video, audio, and images. We would like to include hidden confounders because they are not handled yet. Uh, we would like to include mixed tabular data types. By that, I mean that we would like to handle continuous and discrete data at the same time because the model doesn't do that yet. We would also like to include interventions. So the best way I can explain what interventions are is by giving an example. So say we have an example that A causes B what would happen if we include C in the equation? That is basically what interventions are, and we would like to improve the generalization capabilities of the model. The reason for that is because that gen -N actually is able to compete with us in some sense, and, we will, and that basically gives us room for improvement. And with that being said, that's me done, so hopefully I did it really fast. So yeah, any questions? Uh, I have one question. 
Uh, so I'm not really familiar with uh, how uh, training with the Lagrangian works, but uh, as of my experience in GANs, uh, there has to be uh, different kinds of trainings. First, uh, the generator has to be trained for some epochs and the discriminator, and then go, it goes on and on. Uh, so is this the game? Uh, is is this the case for this one as well, or uh, does it uh, does a Lagrangian help in solving the issue with training the GANs? Uh, the Lagrangian is only used. I mean. Right, so you're technically right, but also not quite. I mean, yes, as you said, the discriminator and the generator are updated, right? And um, and they are updated in the way you actually said. And then the augmented Lagrangian is only used in order to learn the causal structure. So basically what is happening here is, sorry, I just need to go back to this slide real quick. So basically what is happening here is that within this loop, these K times, you are actually updating all of these loss functions just the way you actually are familiar with. This is just what, what's happening. So you're literally just adding another, um, loop over the usual loop. So for example, within code, you can have something like, for example, for number of epochs, train the model, right? So you include that loop within this loop. That's literally all that's happening. And then you update these parameters at the end of the loop, and then you go back here again. That's pretty much all there is to it. Got it. 